Welcome to Spotlight on Migraine, the professional series, a podcast hosted by the Association of Migraine Disorders. In the professional series, we dive deeper into migraine-related topics with the help of guests from the medical field. The content of these episodes is intended for medical professionals, but may be useful or interesting for patients as well. This episode is brought to you in part by our generous sponsors, Amgen Novartis and Alder Biopharmaceuticals. This extended episode features three lectures on the relationship between hormones and migraine. First, Dr. Julie Roth, a women's neurologist, provides an overview of the difference in migraine manifestation in men versus women and an explanation on the cause of these differences. In Section 2, neurologist Dr. Amy Hessler discusses menstrual migraine. She explains the timing of migraine during the menstrual cycle and an assessment of current treatment options for menstrual migraine. Lastly, Dr. Renee Eager, an OBGYN, summarizes contraceptive options and hormonal management for premenopausal women with migraine, including risks and benefits. Since 2015, Amgen and Novartis have been working together to develop pioneering therapies in Alzheimer's disease and migraine. Together, Amgen and Novartis share in a mission to fight migraine and the stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding this debilitating disease. Thanks very much, and thank you again uh, to Dr. Godley for organizing this uh, wonderful and informative and high, very educational uh, day for a neurologist, I think, learning a lot about ENT, which is a field I don't necessarily overlap with as much as I do with OBGYN in my field of women's neurology. And over the next um, hour or so, we'll hear more from OBGYN and also from this field, this growing field of women's neurology. And the reality is that you really can't practice women's neurology without seeing quite a bit of migraine because uh, far and away, it is probably the most prevalent uh, neurological condition that we see in women and is greatly impacted by hormones. So um, global estimates of primary headache disorders in general, um, migraine is definitely, we all know, it's a very prevalent neurological disorder in the general population, otherwise we wouldn't be here. These are estimates from over 10 years ago. Um, and you can tell that this is an older estimate because it's chronic daily headache. A lot of these patients have now been reclassified into chronic migraine or new daily persistent headache. Primary headache disorders tend to be more common in women than men, um, with the exception of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. These are rarer disorders. We do see them as neurologists, but um, Again, they're not very prevalent among the general population, and cluster headache, which is more prevalent in men, leads the pack among the rarer disorders. This is another more recent breakdown about migraine prevalence by country, and it's maybe hard to see the countries, but rather than the takeaway message being that there's a disparity in true migraine among different countries, what I think we should be thinking of from this slide is more about migraine education. So anecdotally, it is extremely common for me, both as a clinician and just as a human being, to hear stories where people say, you know, I, I get these migraines. So what do you mean? Like, I feel like I, my head is throbbing and it's killing me and all I want to do is go and lie in a dark room and I'm sick to my stomach. It's a migraine. And of these patients and people that we all know, Roughly 100% of them are right. <laughs> they didn't need a doctor to tell them they had migraines. If they tell you they, they have migraines, they're usually right. On the other hand, we've heard a lot today about sinus headache. People saying, oh, look, I have a sinus headache, but in fact, you really have a migraine. And so there's a tip of the iceberg phenomenon, not just in our country, but worldwide. I see many patients who thought it was normal to always get a headache that was throbbing around their periods. They didn't know that wasn't part of their menstrual period. They didn't know that that actually has a name, and that's migraine. As you can imagine, migraine affects more women than men, um, but it's a little more complicated than that. It peaks within the childbearing years, and during those years, the ratio between female migraineurs and male migraineurs is the greatest, three to one, sometimes four to one, as Dr. Eager mentioned, um, up to 25% of women during their childbearing years will report migraines. But on the low end and the higher end of the age spectrum, that ratio diminishes to roughly two to one, but not one to one. So there might be more to it than just the hormones. 
This is another breakdown. This was done in a prospective study by Dr. Don Buse at Montefiore Hospital. And this was a very, very large survey um, trying to explore that ratio. They also looked at probable migraine, which is defined as not meeting all of the checkboxes in the International Headache Society criteria. And the ratio was still a bit higher in women than men. What Dr. Buse also looked at, and I realize that you won't be able to see the details of the slide from in the back, but I'll tell you, she looked at the difference between what migraine looks like among women versus men. And these chunks roughly translate to the associated symptoms of migraine, the frequency of migraine, and the pain of migraine. And while they were roughly similar with the frequency and the pain, a lot of the associated symptoms of migraine, the nausea, the light sensitivity, the blurred vision seemed to be more common in women than men. Furthermore, disability was higher among female migraineurs compared to male migraineurs. The MIDAS test has been um, referenced earlier. The MIDAS is a um, validated inventory that assesses disability from migraine. And uh, women scored higher on the MIDAS. They also reported higher rates of ER utilization, urgent care utilization. Interestingly, women were more likely to receive a diagnosis of migraine from their primary care or um, specialist provider, but they were also more likely to receive another diagnosis among those sinus headache, which we've talked about at length today, and also stress headache, which to me is also, what is that? I'm not really sure as a neurologist. But another question arises, are there maybe structural brain differences between male and female migraineurs, men and women in general? So now, moving, so epidemiologic studies are very large, scientific studies are often much smaller, so we can't really give you definitive information about these studies. But in one uh, study, a, a volumetric uh, MRI study and also fMRI study, researchers looked at female and male migraineurs and female and male controls. And what they found on volume measurements of areas of the brain, and this, so I'm actually an epilepsy specialist, and so I'm very interested in the neuroanatomy and what the cortex is doing and what these structures are doing and how they may be connected. So female migraineurs, but not male migraineurs and not the healthy controls of either sex, these female migraineurs had thickening in two major areas of the brain, the posterior insula and the precuneus. The posterior insula is a major hub. Um, these are both hubs, so a lot of epilepsy now, it has to do with nodes or hubs and how these nodes are connected with one another. The posterior insula plays a big role in pain. It plays a big role in the autonomic system. The precuneus is a little more of a mysterious structure we're still learning about. And I asked a few neuroanatomy uh, specialists um, scientists and I looked it up and the precuneus actually plays an interesting role in our sense of self and where we are in the world in relation to other people and our environment. So when I think about migraine, I think about triggers, the stress, what do people think of me? Did I stay up late? What's going on in the weather? What's going on in my environment? And how this might impact migraine. These are women that maybe these structures are not just thicker but hyper-functioning. The second part of this study, they, they applied a noxious thermal stimulation, which sounds like torture, and maybe it is, but you can actually use very, very icy cold water to stimulate pain receptors, and it's not harmful to tissue. It's not destructive to tissue. And that's one way to test pain. And the women, migraineurs on fMRI, they had stronger responses in their limbic system, the amygdala, the parahippocampal gyrus, and these are structures that have a lot to do with our emotions and our memory and our cognition and our concentration. So I think we should all be thinking about how that may play a role in migraine. When you're in the throes of migraine, what is your emotional state like? What is your concentration like? Another way to study hormones is to look at men and men's hormones because we've taken away possible structural or DNA differences, chromosomal differences. And it turns out someone did study this. And about a year ago in our green, we call it the green journal too, our neurology journal, and OBGYN has their own green journal, but they're both the green journal. So men with migraine actually had higher levels of circulating estrogen and slightly lower androgens um, compared to men without migraine. So that's very interesting. So what do these hormones do on the brain? 
Um, they have, uh, the brain has hormone receptors, as you can imagine. And we know this in epilepsy because estrogen is epileptogenic, or it makes seizures, it makes excitable, hyper-excitable brain structures, and progesterone can be anticonvulsant and inhibitory. How might that translate to migraines? Well, it's interesting, and it's probably a bit complicated. In animal models that have looked at this, um, there's one animal model, a mouse model of migraine, um, the Cacna-1A uh, mutant mouse, which is thought to be a model for familial hemiplegic migraine. These mice, when they were given um, uh, female hormones at high levels, particularly estrogens, it enhanced cortical spreading depression, which is thought to be the responsible for the aura of migraine, while male hormones actually protected against it. So that's interesting. Another tidbit, sex hormones may regulate nociception the enhancement of the trigeminal vascular system, which has to do with the pain of migraine and the autonomic dysfunction of migraine. How does this relate to people? What we know, um, and what we'll learn about in the next few talks, um, is that these fluctuations can play a role on female migraineurs who are already at risk for migraines. Um, we know that migraine aura is actually more prevalent in a higher estrogen, higher estrogen state. And we may hear a little bit more about that today. However, there's often a very complex and unpredictable relationship. You know, what we think might be helping our female migraineurs when we start um, you know, making suggestions about hormones, sometimes it actually has a different effect than what we expected. I've had patients who had the Mirena IUD and then their migraines cleared up, but I have no explanation. That progesterone is supposed to act locally. I don't know what happened. So it's very interesting. We do know about the stroke risk that's higher among migraineurs with frequent aura. But I'll say one more thing. There's a third wheel to this that I'm very interested in, which is preeclampsia on the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Migraine is a risk factor for preeclampsia, specifically migraine with aura. Preeclampsia is a risk factor for stroke and, and uh, cerebrovascular disease and cardiovascular disease. Migraine with aura is a risk factor for stroke. So how do these little um, bubbles kind of fit in with, we, with each other? And this is something that we really need to learn more about. So in the end, um, I'd like to see more research in this area. And I think that's the purpose of this symposium. But I'm uh, all set. And I'd like to turn over the podium. Thank you so much. I've been the clerkship director for eight years and I want to leave people with useful information as they leave my talks. Um, so the objectives here that I uh, was asked by Dr. Godley who kindly invited me to speak today was to talk about, um, to review terminology of headaches, to explore the menstrual cycle and the timing of menstrual migraines, and then to assess the treatment option for menstrual migraines. And by this picture, I'm sure there's some of you in the audience who are migraineurs yourselves. I am not a migraineur, but you know, my patients do tell me that it feels as if their brain is being pulled out of their head. So this is probably an accurate description, probably drawn by a migraineur. So in discussing primary headache disorders versus secondary headache disorders, the, amongst us as neurologists, we decided that it's good just to make sure everyone understands these basic definitions. So uh, the International Classification of Headache Disorders is our go-to place as when we as neurologists define uh, migraines and different types of headache disorders. So primary headache disorders is the disease itself. So this encompasses migraine, tension type headaches, the cephalagias, um, the trigeminal autonomic cephalagias, of which Dr. Roth had mentioned cluster being the most famous of that and then the other primary headache disorders. And then when it comes to these secondary headache disorders, there are actually seven categories, all with subcategories. So this was actually an interesting paper that uh, Dr. David Dodick had published in Seminars in Neurology in 2010, and it's a mnemonic that I teach to my medical students, but I think it's helpful to kind of conceptualize how do I think about secondary headache disorders. And this SNOOP with four Ps, um, a SNOOP mnemonic is one that's popularly thought of. So looking for systemic symptoms, neurologic symptoms lasting greater than an hour, onset of a thunderclap in nature, onset over the age of 50, a pulsatile tinnitus, uh, postural uh, aggravation, papilledema on, on exam of the fundus, and then precipitating events. I ask my patients, when you sneeze, cough, bear down, and have a bowel movement, does your head pain worsen? 
So again, instead of getting caught up in all the details of this subclassification, that Snoop's mnemonic is kind of interesting when you're thinking about secondary headache disorders. And as I use with my medical students, you don't want to see a patient in your clinic, or I don't want to see my patient in the clinic, or oftentimes they're going to the emergency room after my rotation, and it be a migrainer, and you don't take a careful enough history, and this headache is different, and they've had a sentinel bleed, and then they drop dead of a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the parking lot. You know, not a good, not a good thing. Even if the, so, taking a careful history is the key. And then this little cartoon I actually borrowed from one of my colleagues because if you're typing a status report on your Facebook page, you're probably not having a migraine. So when we talk about the international classification of headache disorders, we talk about migraine with aura. And this has always seemed to me, when we look at these cri diagnostic criteria, kind of like a Chinese fast food menu. So do you have in A and then in B you have to have um, a reversible aura, and then in C you have to have at least three out of six. So it's a little bit confusing. So uh, migraine with aura, most of the time, it's 90% of the time it's going to be a visual aura. So um, then followed by a sensory aura or a speech and language difficulty. So sometimes people actually have a cluster of aura symptomatology and it usually follows that trajectory that is visual followed by sensory followed by speech. So the interesting thing, however, is that you only need two lifetime episodes of aura to be classified as migraine with aura. And as Dr. Eager was talking about, this is important when you're thinking about in a woman as far as can I give her oral contraception or not with the stroke risk factors. So in, instead of just asking with your headache, do you have a visual aura, because that's the most common, you want to say, have you ever had an aura? So only two lifetime episodes, because I've actually, when I've phrased it differently, had colleagues that, uh, or had patients that have said, yes, I've had that just a couple of times, but most of the time I don't have it. And then three of the six criteria below that it spreads over time. And then migraine without aura. Um, so interestingly, migraine with aura, you only need two of those attacks. Migraine without aura, you need five attacks. And the, the pain can, should be unilateral pulsating. I like to say to patients, if you couldn't use the word pain, how would you describe your headache? Is it throbbing? Is it, is it sharp shooting? Is it stabbing? Just to get a characteristic of the pain that they're experiencing. And then either nausea or vomiting or photo or phonophobia. Now moving to the topic that uh, Dr. Godley had tasked me with, a menstrual migraine. Um, and it's already been touched on a little bit in the earlier talk, but Pure menstrual migraine is just that migraine that is around the time of a woman's menses versus menstrually related migraine is around the time of the menses plus other times during the month. So it's, so it's kind of important to differentiate that in, in optimizing our treatment for our patients. So I am not going to get into the complicated, in the setting of have gyne gynecologists in the audience, the complicated menstrual cycle. What's important in understanding menstrual migraines is that day one is the beginning of when a woman menstruates. And really, as um, Dr. Roth and, and prior to that, what we were speaking of, it's that drop off in estradiol level that really we have to be concerned of um, as far as precipitating migraines or menstrual migraines. So in pure menstrual migraines, it can be two days prior to their menses or three days into their menses. Whereas menstrual related migraines, it's that same time period, but also other times during their menstruation period. So it's really that estrogen withdrawal effect. So I found this was fascinating that in neurology in the early 70s, they recognized this when they looked at these headaches and when these women were having these headaches, that actually estradiol prior to menses um, delayed mens menstrual migraines and then artificially raising this level by giving that woman um, external estrogen um, supplementing that could actually the migraines were not provoked and then some further studies in the late 90s looked at GnRH alone or with estrogen and progesterone then skipping to 2003 it was GnRH alone was not adequate but then adding that uh, transdermal estradiol could be helpful and then this Ann Calhoun in Zephalgia in 2011 
is adding estrogen back throughout the cycle or is potentially decreasing that placebo week or decreasing that period of time could be beneficial. And that's actually what was done in this last study in 2011 where they went from that placebo week of being seven days in duration to being only four days in duration and there was a statistically significant reduction in intensity and duration of the menstrual migraine. So estrogen is, I came up with this, is estrogen is excellent. It's excellent in, you'll hear about it when Dr. Waters speaks next. It's good because you're not having those circulating estrogen levels. And when you have this drop off, this is where the woman with, mens with menstrual migraines is most vulnerable to have that, those attacks. So now importantly, treatment options. So treatment options, so this is a Dr. Tepper, um, who's a, a headache expert, looked at treatment options. So how can we treat these women with their menstrual migraine? Should we treat them acutely? Should we give them short-term prophylaxis or daily preventatives? So for acute treatments, if they're infrequent, their migraines are infrequent, we can give them an abortive therapy. If they have predictable menses and menstrual migraines, then we can give them a triptan or a non-triptan. Or if they're not predictable and they have the menstrual-related migraines, then we might want to consider a daily preventative medication. So as far as the acute, triptan, acute treatments, the triptans were looked at in randomized placebo-controlled trials. Um, various uh, triptans were looked at. Most of them that were looked at had the longer half-lives. So actually, rise the triptan had the best evidence for acute treatment. So their, their criteria was pain-free intervals at two hours, which was between 33 and 73% and then pain relief from 2 to 24 hours. So sustaining pain relief was 63% in sumatriptan, I'm sorry, rizotriptan. And then sumatriptan came in second. Pain-free response at 2 hours was 61 to 63%. So as far as the short-term prophylactics, again, the longer-acting triptans have been looked at. There's been various randomized control trials with frobotriptan, zomatriptan, nertriptan, and then actually comparing them head to head, which I think is interesting, and it, what they found was actually zomatriptan dosed more frequently and frobotriptan dosed BID rather than QD was more effective. But then they realized that TID dosing was better than BID, BID was better than QD. So more frequent, obviously the point being more frequent um, dosing was beneficial. And the non-triptans that were used as, as preventatives were magnesium, uh, naproxen, DHE, and then also estrogens, that was, as was previously talked about. And then lastly, the daily preventatives. So you need to be cautious with the daily preventatives because those can, you can interact with their oral contraception. So topiramate. Um, increases the rate of oral, oral estrogen metabolism at doses. So this is an interesting drug, and we've learned this in epilepsy studies, at doses higher than 200 milligrams a day. But if you stay at 100 milligrams a day, you're not going to interfere with estradiol um, that's metabolism. So it's category D in pregnancy. Now move to category D based on the North American um, Epilepsy Registries in 2011, they were noticing that when women took this for their epilepsy, they were having a higher rate of cleft lip and cleft palate. And so that's why it moved from a category C to a category D. Lamotrigine has limited data for migraine prophylaxis, um, but there's an interesting relationship and Dr. Roth and I and us as um, women neurologists struggle with this because um, it's challenging to use because the levels fluctuate when we use this with our, our um, pregnant patients with epilepsy um, throughout their course of their pregnancy. But the estradiol lowers the lamictal concentration, probably not quite as important in headache as it is in epilepsy when you, have a, when you want to have a consistent level. And it's category C in pregnancy. And then valproate, the interesting story, hopefully everyone in the room is aware that valproate is the is the one that we stay away from because it's associated with neural tube defects. So it's the only drug that is interesting depending on disease state, it has a different pregnancy category. So in migraine, it has a category X. Um, and I teach my residents, my medical students, women of childbearing age, I don't use it in, 
in, in migraine, whereas in epilepsy, it's category D. But Herzog um, showed that there's minimal interaction between valproate and oral contraception. And then gabapentin has mixed data, uh, but it doesn't affect your OCPs. And then it's category C in pregnancy. So in conclusion, menstrual migraines are severe, have longer duration, more resistant to treatment than non-menstrual migraines. Estrogen is excellent. Hopefully I can leave you with that. But as one of my stroke colleagues says, it's not so good in stroke when I, when I show her this slide. So got to be cautious. So it's good for pregnancy and, and, and decreasing that fluctuation of estrogen levels. And again, probably why most migraines improve during pregnancy, as you'll hear next from Dr. Waters. Um, and then menstrual migraines usually improve during pregnancy. And then treatment strategies to think about acute versus short-term prophylaxis versus preventatives. And for acute treatment, the best evidence is rizotriptan followed by sumatriptan. And then short-term uh, prophylactics are probotriptan dosed twice a day and, or, uh, and then zomatriptan dosed three times a day. And then long-term preventatives, we just have to be cautious with the interaction with OCPs. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, everybody. After a, um, such an interesting scientific session prior to this, I think that you're going to find this uh, pretty um, easy uh, to understand and um, uh, interesting topic for an OBGYN to be talking about. Because I want to uh, thank Dr. Godley for the invitation, but I have to say when I received the invitation, I was asking myself, um, what in the world can an OBGYN tell otolaryngologists and neurologists and other migraine specialists um, about headaches, um, because in my world, uh, we, don't, we don't think about that so much. And in fact, I probably can tell you more about all of my favorite athletes than I can about um, headaches. So um, instead, I think I'm actually going to focus on what it is um, that I do every day as um, a, an OBGYN and how our specialty actually looks at headaches. I have no financial disclosures. So my learning objectives are to define the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology's recommendations for contraceptive options for patients with migraines, um, and the US medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use as it relates to migraines and migraines with aura. And then finally, I'm going to review the options for hormonal manipulation, as you refer to it, for premenopausal patients who have menstrual migraine headaches. So as a gynecologist, um, many of my patient vi visits um, center around attempts to either get pregnant um, or to avoid pregnancy. And there are essentially three clinical scenarios um, I address with sexually active, reproductive aged women. So the first is women who actually want to get pregnant. So in these instances, my objectives are to optimize um, a woman's care to keep her and her fetus safe both during, and before and really, and during pregnancy. And preconceptual counseling in these patients includes assessment and um, treatment of medical problems. With respect to um, migraine headache management, patients are often treated with NSAIDs, um, tryptans, and ergot derivatives. In pregnancy, and that will probably be addressed later in this session, um, first-line therapy, therapy is usually acetaminophen. NSAIDs and tryptans are typically used as second and third-line treatments and are um, reserved for use in the second and the third trimesters. Tryptans in particular pose the risk of vasoconstriction of the placental blood supply with sumatriptan having the best safety profile. Ergotamine is actually absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy um, due to the potential to induce hypertonic uterine contractions um, and vasospasm or vasoconstriction. So the second answer is for women who um, want to avoid pregnancy. Um, a typical woman spends approximately five years of her reproductive life trying to get pregnant and the other 30 years trying to avoid it. 
So in fact, data fairly consistently shows that approximately half of all pregnancies are actually unintended. So we generally want to choose a contraceptive method that a patient is likely to be the most compliant with, is the most effective, and would be the safest for her. Sterilization and long-acting but reversible forms of contraception, are, um, which are commonly referred to as LARC methods, um, such as IUDs and implants, are the most effective forms of contraception with, with less than 1% of patients experiencing an unintended pregnancy within one year of use. Spoiler alert, these forms of contraception, even the progestin-secreting IUDs, have proven safety in patients who experience migraine headaches with or without aura and um, in patients who have menstrual migraines. The next most effective forms of birth control include estrogen progestin containing pills, which are often referred to as combined oral contraceptives. This also includes transdermal patches and vaginal rings, as well as intramuscular long acting um, Depo-Provera. And these are methods with one year typical use failure rates of anywhere from six to nine percent. So approximately 28% of U.S. women use some form of hormonal contraception. Up to 25% of U.S. women are affected by migraines, largely during the reproductive years. So the question we are often asked is whether estrogen-containing contraception is safe for women who have migraine headaches. This shows the one-year prevalence of migraine headaches by age and gender. Close to 25% of reproductive age women have regular migraines, and the pre peak pre prevalence is in women who are of reproductive age. So finding a birth control method that is safe and is effective for these women is vitally important. One commonly recognized risk for migraine patients is the risk of ischemic stroke. And this survey by Beck showed that the overall stroke risk increases with age. The risk is 2 per 100,000 in 20-year-olds and 11 per 100,000 in 40-year-olds. This risk increases in the setting of migraine headaches up to 8 per 100,000 in 20-year-olds and 70 per 100,000 for 40-year-olds. The risk increases further with combined oral contraceptive use. Up to 280 per 100,000 women um, who are 40-year-olds who are using combined oral contraceptives are at risk for stroke. 40-year-olds who take combined oral contraceptives who have migraines with aura have one additional stroke per 500 patients. Further evidence for this was published in 2017. These are uh, the results of a national health care claims nested case control study of over 25,000 ischemic strokes among reproductive aged females. And just the use of estrogen containing pills showed an increase in a woman's risk of ischemic stroke. A history of a migraine headache without aura and without the use of estrogen containing pills also increased the risk of stroke. But it was really the presence of migraine with aura that tilted the scale in terms of stroke risk. The risk of stroke was highest with an odds ratio of over six in patients with migraine with aura on estrogen containing oral contraceptives. So I think you are getting the picture here. So when discussing a, thir a, um, a hormonal contraception, it's, um, imp I think it's also important to acknowledge the role that progesterone can play Second and third generation progestins were developed to actually provide less androgenic properties than first generation progestins did. The third generation progestins in particular have this advantage. However, early studies suggested an increased risk of venous thromboembolic events, particularly with the third generation progestins. A number of other factors which we're not going to discuss today may influence this risk as well. Levonorgestrel is a second-generation progestin and is considered the progestin with the lowest VTE risk. But the important thing is that second or third-generation progestins do not seem to impact the risk of ischemic stroke, 
regardless of what dose of ethanol estradiol they are combined with as an, a combined oral contraceptive. This um, was based on a 2016 systemic review of 26 articles, which showed that progestin-only pills, injectables, implants, and levonorgestrel, which is a progesterone-secreting IUDs, um, were not associated with an increased risk for any venous or arterial events. So um, progestin-only contraceptive formulations, even oral ones, which may not actually be as effective as those that contain estrogen, um, are considered generally safe even in patients with a history of migraine with aura. So how do we determine eligibility for various contraceptive methods? The U.S. medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use and the U.S. selected practice recommendations for contraceptive use are guidelines which have been adapted by the CDC from the World Health Organization. Um, they provide recommendations on the safe use of contraceptive methods for women with various medical conditions. This is actually an app that you can get on your phone, and if you don't already have it, you should consider um, downloading it. The, um, the data is updated every five years and was last um, updated in 2016. The recommendations are divided into four categories. So categories one and two are conditions where either no restrictions exist or the method can generally be used safely with appropriate follow-up. Categories three and four indicate the contraceptive choice um, poses potential health risks to a patient are generally not recommended. So ACOG, or the American College of OBGYN, recommends that at the time of contraceptive initiation, the diagnosis of migraine with or without aura should be carefully considered in all women who present with a history of headache. Combined hormonal contraception can be used in women who have migraine without aura and no other risk factors for stroke um, with a US MEC category of two. Whereas estrogen containing contraceptives are not recommended for women who have a migraine with aura because of the increased risk of stroke with an MEC category of four. So the third and the final reason we prescribe contraception is as an adjunct in the treatment of disease. Examples of this would include women who use combined oral contraceptives um, as a way to decrease monthly menstrual period when they have symptomatic anemia, or women who use progestin-secreting IUDs um, to help prevent the risk of um, the development of endometrial hyperplasia, for example, if they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And menstrual migraines, in my estimation, actually fill, falls in this type of category. <clears throat> so menstrual-associated migraines um, affect approximately 8 to 14 percent of women. These are headaches that typically occur within two days before the onset of menses and last through the third day of menstruation. They are almost invariably migraines without aura. Fluctuations in normal cycling estrogen and progesterone levels appears to be the trigger in the initiation of these headaches, although I look forward to what my neurology colleagues have to say about that. Um, in particular, menstrual migraines appear to be triggered by a physiologic drop in progesterone levels at the time of menstruation. Well, progesterone and estrogen, both. So menstrual migraines can be treated with NSAIDs, tryptins and ergot derivatives. In fact, a, um, a small placebo-controlled trial published in 1990 showed that prophylactic naproxen given twice daily beginning seven days before the onset of menses will significantly decrease the frequency, severity, and the duration of a menstrual migraine when compared with placebo. So the goal of hormonal, menstruation, um, hormonal treatment regimens for menstrual migraine is to minimize estrogen and progesterone fluctuation most combined hormonal contraceptives allow for a drop in the ethanol estradiol concentration during a placebo week, which can trigger the menstrual migraine. So the extended use of hormonal contraception is an effective and safe way of minimizing endogenous hormonal fluctuation. And by this I mean using a particular hormonal contraceptive in a continuous, uninterrupted fashion. For patients with menstrual migraines, the use of continuous um, combined oral contraceptives, rings, or 
progestin only oral pills, Depo-Provera and even subdural um, progestin secreting implants are all ways of eliminating normal hormonal estrogen and progesterone cycling. So rather than being contraindicated, these methods offer ways to improve headache severity and frequency. And when using oral contraceptives this way, eliminating the pill-free or placebo week is not only safe, but it also preserves a, um, a stable hormonal environment. Um, and while progesterone secreting IUDs are safe for women who have migraines, they really don't, are not particularly helpful um, in, um, uh, in the, the treatment of um, the menstrual associated headaches. So to summarize, ACOG and the USMEC classify non-estrogen containing contraceptive methods safe for women with migraines with or without aura. The ischemic stroke risk um, associated with estrogen containing contraceptives is unacceptably high for women um, with migraine with aura. And effective alternatives exist for these patients desiring reliable contraception. Um, for patients with menstrual migraines, the use of hormonal methods that allow for steady state estradiol levels appears to be effective in mitigating and in some cases eliminating menstrual migraines altogether. Thank you for your time. Since 2015, Amgen and Novartis have been working together to develop pioneering therapies in Alzheimer's disease and migraine. Together, Amgen and Novartis share in a mission to fight migraine and the stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding this debilitating disease. Thank you for tuning in to Spotlight on Migraine. For more information on migraine disease, please visit migrainedisorders.org.